Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have join me, Rene Rodriguez. Rene, welcome. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's great to be here. Yeah, so you are an author, a speaker, a consultant, a coach. You're the CEO. Uh, MeetRene.com is <clears throat> you know where people can find out more about you. But really, what my understanding of what you do and what I want to uh, dive into our conversation here today is kind of taking the application of brain research combining that with with leadership development, employee engagement, sales training, uh, and you've helped many well-known organizations. You've uh, you know gone on stage in front of these organizations or worked with them personally, but companies like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Wells Fargo, Verizon, Cargill, 3M, uh, and many more. And then you also have uh, a new book uh, that is Amplify Your Influence, Transform How You Communicate and Lead. Um, does that sound all about right? It's, it's been a long 28 years, yes. There we go, yeah, there we go, right? Uh, overnight success in yeah, 28 years. Um, exactly. Well, I, yeah, I wanna go back in time, kind of take us to the early days. Before you started speaking on stages, before you started doing what it is that you do today, um, what were you doing? Like, how, how do you kind of get started or even before that, where, where did the things kind of begin for you? What, you know, so things began for me as a salesperson. Uh, I was I got cut from the basketball team when I was 18 years old in college, my sophomore year, and yeah. here I was. And where, had, where was this? The University of St. Thomas in uh, Minnesota, St. Paul, yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. And so here I was thinking that I had this career ahead of me in basketball and had the discipline and the hard work and the work ethic. I didn't like school very much, and got a chance to uh, once I got cut. You know, life, you know, long story, devastated, didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. And got a chance to talk to an executive who um, I asked him one question. I said, what's the one thing that I got to do to be in your shoes when I get older? And he looked at me, he smiled, and he said, okay, you learn how to sell. If you learn how to sell, you'll always be employed. Mm. And so for me, that, you know, at 18, being coachable and raw in every way, being rejected, having really sort of a difficult journey through basketball, I guess really prepared me for that. And mm -hmm. so I got a job as a selling cookware door to door. Uh, in, was it Cutco? In, uh, no, Cutco made the knives. It was, it was at first yeah. it was Royal Prestige, and then yeah. moved over to a company called Salad Master. All right. And so going through that whole process was perfect for me. You know, one, mm -hmm. massive amounts of rejection, but learning how to sell a very difficult high-end idea, which is you gotta sell, you know, normally you, people have hand-me-down cookware or they get something at a wedding, mm -hmm. and here we're convincing them to change their lifestyle and spend $2,500 on mm -hmm. their uh, cooking, you know, we called it kitchen jewelry, but it was really a whole system for health. And what I wanted to do was learn how to sell a difficult idea. And mm. that was what probably one of the best things that served me and still to this day serves me in how you sell an idea. Prior to that time, did you have any kind of sales experience? Zero. How did you feel it's about it. sales? Like, was that something that were you, I mean, sound like you were excited by that idea when the executive kind of gave you that, um, that feedback, but a lot of people feel very uncomfortable just even around the concept of sales. It's like sales <laughs> is a, is a bad word, right? Something that you don't necessarily have to do hopefully and just people come to you if you're good at what you do how did you feel about sales kind of before and then at the, that early stage so i was taught about sales early on that it was what makes the world go round mm. and to me it's if i sell a product someone spends money that allows me the company to also then turn around and buy groceries and food which employs people and spends money which then mm -hmm. spends more money for other people and spends more money it keeps yeah. things moving around but i also learned that very early on that if I have a good solution for something and somebody has a real problem that feels like they don't have a solution for, then it's an obligation for me to communicate my solution in the best way possible. And, and it's, a, it's a calling in that sense. And it's also the same obligation to not sell something just mm -hmm. because I can. And so there's a, selling to me is one of the, is the most, in my opinion, the most beautiful profession because of what it requires to be good at it. And when you can help shift someone's attention from what they thought was one thing to another mm. and watch them change their lives to the better. That is what's true leadership is about. I mean, selling something to people that already believe what you do is no nothing. Like being a leader during good times is nothing. Mm -hmm. But when you can when you can give somebody new information in a persuasive enough way for them to really rethink to say, I never thought about it that way. I never thought of eating this way might 
change my life or I've never thought of changing the process in my business would be this way or this technology or maybe this kind of service to learn, you know, if you're selling, let's say emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. you're selling that, well, maybe if I'm a better EQ as a leader, I'd be a better leader and treat people better. If you can sell those ideas to the people that don't want to hear it, that to me is an amazing skill set. Mm. At what point in your journey did you start to become interested in psychology and kind of you know, behavioral neuroscience and really what's going on inside of the brain and then connecting it to leadership and, and to sales? So I was 18 probably, so same, around the same time period, and my mother asked me a question. She said, Renee, look around this room and, and what does everybody here have in common? And I tried figuring it out and I couldn't figure it out. She said, Renee, everybody here has a brain. And if you can understand how the brain works, life becomes easier. And so when I was in high school, I didn't like school either, but there was the psychology teacher, we took an intro to psych, brought in a magician, and I was hooked. I was like, wow, okay, using magic to get me to like school and persuade, you know, the, the, the sensation and perceptual illusion was intriguing to me. It's like, okay, I can do school this way. Mm -hmm. And so it got me intrigued in the learning process. But it also said, okay, psychology is a cool thing. And when she talked about the brain, I'm like, okay, I need to understand this thing we all have in common. Because if I can understand what drives us, what truly drives us, how decisions are made, then what are the motivations? What are the underlying pieces? What are the things that you think you know, but really aren't there? And you came to realize, and you, you realize really quickly, is that most of the motivation, motivations that we have, when I say motivations, I'm not talking about rah, rah. The motivation to buy something, to eat, or to go in a certain direction, follow a vision very little of that is a conscious process. And there's so many factors that are unconscious that are influenceable to drive that. That to me, it became fascinating and scary because it can be used for wrong as well, but just like anything. Right. What was going on in your mom's mind, do you think at that time when she brought up that question? Like, I'm, I'm very interested in why do you think she even brought that up? And then who, who was your mom? Like, what was her background and what was she doing career-wise or just lifestyle-wise? Um, give us a little kind of look into that stage. So my mother was a consultant at the time too. So she ran a very successful change management consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And in that firm, the, they used brain research to uh, help people deal with change. And so for me to, to go to school for the brain and have a sales background, and then go to work for her afterwards. You know, they were doing 55 workshops a month. She had 37 consultants, um, very successful, about $28 million in business over you know seven, eight year period. Yeah. And But she was a former nun too. So she was like, so not a business person. Right. So this is somebody who yeah. really had a very unique approach to understanding behavior mm. at a mass scale, and then was introduced to you know rudimentary brain research uh, is as part of her master's degree and, and sort of her journeys through the world and meeting people and then learned to, to apply it. And so I followed that same route, except took a more technical route, added the sales component to it, as well as the, the business side of things. And so mm -hmm. the early mentorship that, you know, and she didn't go out of her way to mentor me. It was just one of those things that this was her passion is what she did. Right. And I got a chance to observe it for many years and just watch and to be a part of it and memorize and learn and, and, and have the conversations around, you know, how do you create change in a way that doesn't, you know, in her, her words were leave dead bodies, right? Cause mm. you know, she lived in five countries all before the age of 25. Wow. And so I was born in Cuba, lived there before and after the Cuban revolution was in Germany after the Holocaust in Panama during the Panama Canal crisis was a nun on the border of Haiti with the guerrilla warfare going on and, and was in Vegas during the A-bomb testing. So all before 25, the war was and, and revolution was in her soul. And she saw the, the, the promise of it and the romantic side of, of revolution, but she also mm -hmm. saw the destructive death toll that it took on people emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Mm -hmm. And so she was always driven with, you know, how do you create change without leaving dead bodies? How do you create change that actually lasts? Because that was a big one too. Like you know, m momentary change anybody can do, but long-lasting change was something that that she always drove her. And so for me, studying the brain was getting the research behind what she was saying already, mm -hmm. and focusing on the applied science, not the research. There was a lot of some lot smarter people than me out there. But what I what I my skill was is how do you apply it? As long as I could speak their language and I could read their research and I could talk and I understand it but I could also challenge them to say, okay, what does that mean mm -hmm. in life? I got to imagine that in your mom's time, there weren't many 
consulting businesses that were at the kind of scale and size that hers was, right? So uh, when you look back or kind of just think about your mom and that business that, that she had then, what, what do you think? I mean, you talk about some of the beliefs that she had, but what do you feel was like the mindset that maybe gave her an advantage or, or what do you think are kind of the, the, the keys that allowed her to create so much success, especially as a woman, um, you know, at that time where I don't think it was nearly as common as, as it is today. And, you know, she built up a very sizable business. So what stands out for, for you about your, your mom and the success that she created? One, she, she had something different. She was driven by something. She was, she was purpose driven one. Mm. And, you know, she didn't see herself as a female Cuban trying to make it there. She just saw herself as somebody who knew how people functioned yeah. and understood how to create change. And mm. she did that in the communities. And when she was asked to do that in business, she realized that people are the same. Mm -hmm. They still have the same needs. <clears throat> they still have the same needs of feeling respected. They still have the same needs of validation. They still have the same needs of wanting to be in community and work together and to do their best work. And what she also found were that leaders were so far removed from being able to communicate in that way. And if she could bridge that gap, that magical things would happen. Mm -hmm. She also found out that, that, that we function in a sequence. There's a, there's a sequence to how the brain works and there's a sequence in communication that matters. There's, you know, you have to connect before you can build trust and you get the, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have trust before I'm going to listen to you. And there's, I mean, there's, those are sequences that we, mm -hmm. we all kind of know about. And she was able to tap into some really what we would call legacy type leaders, people that were very successful and had a lot of power like in companies like DuPont that also knew that there was something missing. Mm. It wasn't just numbers and strategy and direction and vision, that there was a people component to this. And you're absolutely right. Back then, there was no talk about EQ or emotional intelligence. There was no talk about you know, leadership best practices and you know, the, you know, the importance of communication. It, it was none of that. And so it was very ahead of her time, but the good, the, the, let's say good leaders, the leaders that had really faced reality mm -hmm. knew that there was a missing component that had to do with people yeah. and had to do with emotion because emotion was not a discussion in business back then. And for her to bring a safe way to, to talk about it and, and the results that she was able to get were incredible and undeniable. Mm. Well, you probably weren't expecting to come on the podcast here today and, and talk about your mom, but I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, sharing some of that because I think there's some very valuable lessons and inspiration uh, from from her story. Not a problem. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. So literally, there, there we go. Yeah, hundred um, percent <laughs> and figuratively too. Yeah. So let, let's bring it back to to you, and and I'm wondering, you know, as you started to kind of strengthen your sales skills and you became more interested in psychology and how the mind works and finding ways to connect all, all of these things. If we fast forward in terms of your own business, are there one or two things that stand out, like one or two kind of mindsets or principles or just something that you learned about how the mind works and you applied it to your business, Renee, and you saw just extraordinary results? Is anything that comes to mind? I think a couple of things. One, the mindset is that we're always selling. I mean, if you're in consulting, you have to be okay with the sales process. And you have to have a re, you have to reframe it for yourself. Like mm -hmm. if if I had the cure for cancer for you, and I said, hey, you know, Michael, it seems like you might have this cancer, and you know, like, but you got to go get it tested for like ten thousand bucks. You'd be like, okay, thanks, Renee. Did you take a class on this or something? You know, you, right. I'm like, nah, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I just, you know, I took one class on it, and it seems like you might be, and you'd be like, yeah, okay, no, go kick rocks. I'm not doing that. And you know, six months later, you find out that you actually had it. You come back to me like, Renee, what do I do? I'm like, well, oof, I'm sorry, would have, it's too late. We would have had to deal with it back then. You would have been upset that I didn't sell you more, that I didn't mm -hmm. communicate better. And selling is about communicating value. Mm. That's all it is. How best can I communicate value? What I think people say they don't like selling is they don't like to be pushy right. or unethical. And well, I don't either. Nobody mm -hmm. wants that. But I need to be able to communicate my value in the best way possible. And I also need to understand that most buyers are procrastinators. So part of the sales process is to help people overcome procrastination and bettering their business and their lives. Mm. And that's helping them make decisions. You can call that closing. You can call that driving the sales process. Whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. If I mm. sell something that I believe in, then I need to be able to act as if I believe in it. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to have some conviction on it. And what I use is I have to care enough to be unreasonable. I have to care enough to be unreasonable. Sometimes you have to care enough to be hard on the people that you love. Mm. And sometimes my clients have to care enough about them to tell them, no, you need to look at this differently. And my clients know I'm very honest with them. I'm like, if they're wrong, I'm gonna tell them. I say, no, you're wrong and here's why. But mm -hmm. here's what you can do and here's the opportunity. 
And yeah. the, the value in that I think was huge. The other piece too is the realization that opportunity and innovation come from constraint. And if I can predict behavior, meaning if I know in my industry or my client's industry that some tragic thing happens or some pandemic happens, mm -hmm. well, I can predict certain behaviors. One of them is irrationality. And if I can then do the opposite, in a world of irrationality, I can be a, a rational voice of reason. And if I also know during those points of time that people stop marketing, they stop communicating and they get scared, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna market more, communicate more, give away more information for free during that time. Because mm -hmm. you know, like during the pandemic, we knew that you know, we lost 100 events. And meaning no, no flights, no in-person events, that means we didn't exist. I didn't exist. There was no business. They, they just what you, your medium of communication right. is gone. It's like the, the top just got turned off. Completely. And we had to literally cancel 100 events, millions. And my team looked at me and I just started smiling. <laughs> and they said, what are you laughing at? I go, so, well, this is my first time. The same thing happened in 9-11. Mm. And they go, so why are you smiling? I said, because this is going to be the most innovative time that we've seen in a long time. Mm. And they said, why? I said, well, my mother taught me a lesson a long time ago. I had to, made the mistake of telling her that I was bored. And she said, okay, go over there and, and play with your crayons for 15 minutes and I'll, and I'll come back and play with you. And so I grabbed my Crayola box 64 pack, the one that, you know, the angels sing because there's so many colors that came out of it <laughs> and the sharpener in the back. And she said, nope, you can't have the whole box. You can only choose two colors. Hmm. I looked at her like, I was, like she was crazy. I'm like, what do you mean two colors? She said, be creative. She said, Renee, creativity doesn't, have, doesn't mean you can use every color in the spectrum or isn't about using every color in the spectrum. Creativity is about having only two colors and working wonders with those colors. Mm. And when you realize that creativity comes from constraint, that means that we're about to go through a recession. We're about to go through an increase in prices here. We're about to go a drop here. You go, great. Mm -hmm. Let's see the creativity. Let's see what innovations come about. And I want to be on the forefront. That mindset creates a narrative inside of our brain. And narratives are things that we see that the media and politics are creating. But narratives are also things we either buy into for ourselves or other people sell on to us. Mm -hmm. And the scariest and most exciting part about narrative is that narratives are constructs of reality. So the narrative I buy into creates my reality. Mm -hmm. So if I go through a pandemic and I say, this is exciting because this is going to be innovative, then I'm gonna start seeing innovative idea opportunities. I'm gonna start seeing opportunities to solve problems. I'm gonna start seeing things that are slow that need to be increased or sped up. I'm gonna be see the inefficiencies that could be made more efficient. All of those are points of value. Mm -hmm. And if you know how to communicate, back to the sales communication piece, communicate value of that, then I can monetize that into a business. And if you help during the downturns, even if it's free, because you do a lot of free work in this work, even if it's free, people will remember you when times are good. They'll always remember you. And so if we believe in what we're doing, these things, these are predictable behaviors. The creativity, innovation comes from constraint and learn how to communicate value. You'll always be successful in this business. So Renee, I, I completely agree. And I want to jump in and interrupt for a moment here. So I apologize for that. But you know, when you're Please. sharing this whole idea and and what you've seen play out and certainly i've seen this firsthand and i'm so i'm a very big believer in this concept as well but do you think like is there a more powerful principle that separates those who succeed from those who struggle beyond what you just mentioned or is this is this like the key that that everything else connects to in your experience i i caution myself anytime anytime i sound like i'm saying silver bullet stuff yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say all of that with a grain of salt. I, I believe that the, the, the reality we choose, that the narrative that we create for ourselves and the frames that we choose will help us either see opportunity or not. Yeah. And yeah. then now, seeing opportunity is one thing. Being prepared for it is another. Mm -hmm. There's so many opportunities that come across me that I'm just not prepared for. Sure. God, I mean, just like I wish I could do X, but I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time, but I can't do this. There's so being prepared as well as managing how you view and the narratives that you buy into, mm -hmm. I think are the most important pieces. But you got to be good at what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You can have a great narrative and, and live in la la land, but just not, not know how to add value. Yeah. So it's a marriage of all of those elements. 
The, the other word that you used, actually, you said this twice, was unreasonable. Can you offer an example of what does being unreasonable look like in a client situation? So, so many opportunities. I think that, you know, a client, um, say, for example, even in pricing, you know, when I, the pandemic hit, I did, you know, 3, 320 virtual events because we had to figure it out. As you can see, I'm in a really nice studio here. This is my desk. And I've got four studios in my office because we built it because of the pandemic. This is all innovative stuff. I can hit mm -hmm. a button and control everything in here. And we've got lights. I think there's 42 lights in here, six microphones, five cameras, you know, all controlled by me. Now, none of that would have happened had it not been for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I did 320 virtual events, most of which were free during that time to learn how to do this. Last night, even, we were plugging in a new th new thing and testing the mics. How does this sound? How does that sound? How's new mixer. And I'm on my hands and knees, my guy's remote telling me what, I felt like MacGyver <laughs> trying to plug everything in. Yeah. And when we look at that and we say, okay, putting all of those elements together, right? How do we then translate that into value? How do we translate that into something that I can turn into value? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the biggest question. Yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned the virtual presentations, keynotes, right? You're now back doing live keynotes, I believe, um, right? You're, is that happening now or is it all virtual? Oh, yeah. No, more, more live than virtual. Well, I guess it's, it's we're booked solid live and then yeah. we're, we're fitting in as many virtual events in the downtime as possible. Okay. So you have live keynotes, you have virtual sessions, you have uh, workshops. If you look mm -hmm. at kind of the breakdown of popularity or where, where you see the demand, but also the percentage of revenue that is created from each of the different offerings that you have, what does that look like? What's kind of the makeup of we do this the most, then this, and kind of how that fits in with revenue as a percentage? So I'll answer that and the previous question because I just realized sure. that I, I lost track on what you had asked previously around an unreasonable example because right. they, they kind of go hand in hand. So we built the studio and uh, a client asked me, what's the cost of the virtual event? And I said, it was, it was $20,000. When they looked at me, they were crazy. They said, 20000 for doing it from your computer? I said, no. I said, here's the thing. I go, when you host your events live, you have to get a stage. You have to have camera crews. You have to have audio crews. You have to have uh, technicians. Build, build a backdrop. Lighting. $90 a gallon in coffee. <laughs> you have all of these costs. And you got to fly everybody in, put them in a hotel. And you got to feed them. I go, you're two, $300,000 in minimum, mm. minimum, maybe $500,000 in. I said, in this event, you have none of that. All the production burden falls on me. And I show them my lights. I show them the things I'm doing. I said, my job is to keep, and I stand in front of my touch screen and how things come alive on screen. And, and I said, my job is now to be the production. And I have spent almost $100,000 in doing that. Mm. I said, so that's why it's that. And they looked at me, they go, sold, okay. <laughs> I had to be unreasonable in accepting their old frame, mm -hmm. right? I had to be unreasonable. Now, if a leader is saying, I'm gonna go down this path of you know, communicating one thing, then I have to then be unreasonable. Be like, I can't let you do that. And if you're, if you're gonna do it, I at least need to tell you what you're gonna face. Mm -hmm. And to be able to communicate that over and over and over and over again, even if it be, you know, becomes an argument. My clients and I argue all the time. And, you know, and I'll tell him, I said, you didn't hire me to tell you yes to everything. Mm -hmm. I said, you hired me to tell you where I think your risk is. Mm. And I think this would be a big mistake. Just to jump in for a minute on this, Renee, because, you know, we see this play out so often where consultants, um, you know, firm owners are, are hesitant to engage in this kind of direct feedback uh, or disagreement with, with, especially with buyers, because they yeah. don't want to lose the potential business. What would you say to them? I mean, you know, you have the perspective of doing this yourself, being in the business, but also the understanding of how the mind works. What, what kind of counsel advice would you provide to somebody who's just hesitating in, in providing that real direct, honest truth, even if it goes completely against what the buyers tell them that they want? Well, I think there's a balance in it, in it all, right? Because there, there's a balance and I get the need to, 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 to close the deal mm -hmm. and I get the need to find ways to add value. And you know, if you can accommodate what, because the value of the client is looking for, you have to, because, you know, value is defined by them, not us, right? People buy for their reasons, not ours. And so we have mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Where we have to, where we have to be willing to 
push back is when their definition of value might be construed, mm. right? And you know, they, they might say, okay, Renee, great. I, you, have, you have your three-day workshop. Wonderful. Can you do it in a day? No. <laughs> and I go, unless we change the deliverable. Right. Right. And I'm happy to, but I go, the promise that you're asking takes me three days to get to. Now, the deliverable that I promised you, excuse me. And I go, if you want me to give you the same promise in a day, I'd be lying to you. Mm -hmm. So it's, I can't. And so I have to be able to go do that. But I think that you, there's ways to say things and say, you know, one, I like to frame things up from the beginning to say, you know what, I go, hey, I believe in something very deeply, which is care enough to be unreasonable. Mm. And sometimes there are things that I'm going to disagree with you. Let me ask you, Mr. and Mrs. Client, do you, are you okay with me pushing back if I disagree with you? Mm. And they're going to, what do you think they're going to say? Oh, absolutely. It's what I'm paying okay. you for. I said, great. I said, this is one of those moments. Right. And I might smile. I said, and here's why. And I go, I'm not saying that I have a crystal ball. All I'm saying is I'm going to lay out what my concerns are. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for you to listen to them. And then maybe reassess if that's the right approach. Now, if you listen to them and you're okay with the risk, hey, let's do it. Right. But there's ways to sort of approach things in a way that doesn't have to be antagonistic. Like if I'm arguing with my clients, that's already because we've built massive rapport. Sure. Right? And so we've built enough trust and rapport that we can do that. And, mm -hmm. But you can't start off that way. You know, just like everything has a sequence. It's what we wrote in the book, Sequence is Everything, Chapter 2. It's like... You build the rapport in that so that so that I can be more tough on you, so that I can be more real, not so that I can be softer and more you know laid back and go fishing. No, I'm like we're, we're, this isn't fishing isn't in golfing isn't our relationship. Like right. me helping you grow your business is. Now, if you want to go golf because it's fun and build a relationship, I'm cool if if we have both have time. But I'd I'd much rather add value. Mm -hmm. How yeah. do we do that? Yeah, no, I think it's very compelling. So let, let me just bring us then back to the, the previous question in terms of the breakdown of your service offerings and kind of what you provide. Um, give us a sense of what, what that looks like today, because I know you're on stage a lot, you know, giving presentations, keynotes to, to large audiences, uh, but you also have these kind of one day, three day workshops. What does that look like? Do people typically start with one over the other? And then percentage wise, kind of what's the breakdown in terms of business across those? So key keynotes, and so I'm telling anybody who's wanting to get in consulting, learn how to speak. It's the best brochure you'll ever have. It's if you can learn how to speak, which really means to clearly articulate an idea in front of a room, mm -hmm. the psychology of what happens when you're the one in front of the room and you're articulating an idea that an entire room is following and taking notes on or maybe making taking action from or feeling inspired by or emotionally moved by speeds your sales cycle time indefinitely like it's it's it just it, it almost eliminates the sales cycle time right. you move from trying to get an appointment over six weeks to a year to one phone call they're ho seeing how they can get you in mm -hmm. and so that's the main reason you need to learn how to speak but so speaking is one of those pieces and and also keynotes um pay very very well meaning that and, and i was frustrated by that for many years because you're not going to change an organization through a keynote. Mm -hmm. You know, consulting services do. The things that, you know, our listeners uh, listening to this do, that yeah. you're changing the world. But a keynote goes in there for an hour and they get paid in godly amounts of money. And, and you go, but nobody changed. So, no, but they were able to capture the attention of an entire audience, entire company around an idea. And mm -hmm. it's a special skill set. So if you can do that, it's good. Then it translates into the things that, because to me, I didn't want to get rid of the pieces that feel very... Um, that's not scalable, you know, but it's also sure. the parts that's more rewarding. And then, and so, Renee, so just, there, just one thing I think for those that aren't familiar with the world of, of keynote speaking, give us a sense of when you talk about, you know, large amounts of money or, or great compensation for that one hour talk, what, what does that look like in terms of a range of actual price that you can command? Well, let's look at the lowest, low, low, low end, $2,500 for a keynote. Mm -hmm. but where else are you getting paid $2,500 an hour? Right? To my fee, 35000 where, where's where that? So find your re range within that. I've got friends that are fifty. Right. I was just on stage with Gary V's two hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. Ed Milet, you know, seventy five to one hundred, and probably going up because he's blowing up. You know, <laughs> these guys, you know, people that are these these they're 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 real. It's a real deal. But they yeah. get on that stage and they move you. They move ideas. They move. They move things. But twenty five hundred dollars is great. But you know, and sometimes even free because you mm -hmm. might be speaking to a group of. CEOs. I speak at Vistage, which is one of the largest consortium of group CEOs in the world. And, you know, they pay slightly under my fee. 
that's fine. There's also three to 600 CEOs in a room. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be able to have access to that, that's a value in right. return. But they also buy books and, you know, sure. like so, you, so you deliver that keynote talk. What typically happens after that? Like where does that lead in terms of your other offerings? So there's keynotes. We have a workshop called Amplify. That's a two and a half day uh, boot camp for 12 people that uh, they, is uh, $6,000 per person, but they go through a very intense process of speaking in front with me critiquing and showing them the Amplify methodology. And so yeah. they're learning how to tell their story. They're learning how to flush out their origin story. They're learning the sequence of how to, to craft um, um, a method, a talk, uh, a difficult idea. Some people come because they're, they're, they've got a new product they're trying to launch and we're creating the story and the ethos behind that. Mm -hmm. But they're learning how to create it, but they're also getting the feedback on body language and timing and tone of voice and mm -hmm. how to do that. But the goal is to get to their heart and their heart is their values, their beliefs and their memories. Mm -hmm. And if they can speak from there, it becomes the most powerful, most influential way to connect with people. Right. And it's a intense process. We limit it at 12 people so that people can actually really, really get the the one on one attention they, they need. Mm -hmm. Um, we have an and, course and how called, much of, the, of your time is that taking in, in terms of percentage, like on a monthly basis or annual basis, what percentage would that be? We do three of them a month. Last year we did 34. Okay. Um, this year we're on track to do whatever three a month is. What's three and times 12? Is that virtual or is that in person? Live. Live. And is it always yep. in one location? Like you're going to a company's location doing it or you're moving around? All over from uh, New York, Miami, LA. So uh, you're, ra you're uh, racking up plenty Hotsboro. of air airline points. Yeah, I'm at 340 already to halfway through the year. So yeah, there we go. it's okay. it's wild. But yeah, so we do we do that, and then we have a course called Engage, which is um, a course that an offshoot of what my mother created. My mother passed away in February, by the way. So this oh, wow. is sort of um, me, the, her legacy, sort of living on. But Beautiful. the Engage course was a the course that she created. She called it back then the fundamentals of rapid change. Mm. But it's really about employee engagement, and you know the, the, that wasn't a buzz term back then, but how do you use brain research to help people engage and trust in teamwork mm. in real communication skills that are needed in the real day to day? How am I going to, how am I going to deal with when you and I don't get along and how do we solve that problem? Well, that doesn't involve HR. It doesn't involve my manager. How do you and I solve that? And when you engage a group in that, that possibility and you give them tools, you watch organizations shift. So that's engaged. That's one day. And uh, and then there's from here to there, I try to do as little of these as possible, but we've got the sort of customized consulting things that will be brought in to look at a very specific challenge or a very yeah. specific challenge, whether it be in sales, because we do some sales training pieces as well. Right. Lots of virtual courses that we have. And then we also are launching our on-demand video mm -hmm. Amplify course, which is a interactive um, course that lasts a year. So Rene, you clearly have a lot going on, right? Like several different offerings. Um, I know you have a team, I believe what a handful of people or so, but how do you manage all that? It's like, what's for you, what's the key to making sure that you can not only pull all these off successfully, but just day to day, like you're, you're flying to different places, you're traveling, you're delivering all these different things. Some people have a hard time just even, you know, being clear about like one or two offerings here. You have many more than that. What, what have you learned, um, about that? And do you plan to continue offering a lot or do you think you want to actually start to to cut back some of those. Like what's been your, your experience and secret to making all that work so far? Having an incredible team. So mm. we've got um, my wife, first and foremost, who's our chief operating officer, uh, my boss, and who is one of the best executors I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. So an idea gets in her hand, it's going to happen. The book happened because of her. Mm. Uh, the podcast launched because of her. This new online offering happened because of her. It, it's, you know, I put an idea in her hand, I get scared because my calendar is going to reflect the execution of this idea, really? come hell or high water. Yeah. And she is, she is a doer. She um, respects the creative process, but not at the expense of the business. And so she's a businesswoman. And um, then we have Jenny, who's our uh, VP of, of events, who is an event Dynamo is the only way I can say it. I mean, her ability to plan and to connect with people and to go through the details and make sure that everybody has a great experience mm. and, you know, all of the details. So her, Jenny and Maddie working together 
uh, are incredible. So it usually, I mean, it takes both of them to manage my calendar because they're maximizing trips. Like even just today, we have a, an event that, you know, it's on, I have a keynote on a Wednesday. I fly on a Thursday, start, um, excuse me, keynote Wednesday, then Thursday, and then f start the event on Friday evening. But they asked if I could speak in a different city Friday morning. Mm -hmm. So they get together and they go, okay, flights, everything, we could do this. We'll move the dinner an hour. You know, So they're constantly moving and shifting, sometimes even calling a client. Is there any chance we could move? You know, So they're amazing at the getting me in front of groups. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, we've got um, one of the most talented designers uh, ever. His name is George. And I've worked him for years and I finally just said, you know what, the world is changing. Design and is in visual is so important in, mm. in the social media world. Is he and, the one that does all like your website and all that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Did a great job. He's he's incredible. And he he loves the work and finding people that love the work too, that it's not a job is important. That's my first thing. I mean, when I hired a PR firm, was, you know, do you love the work? We're about to launch a really big social media campaign. And, and my first interview I said, what do you think about the work? And if they can get passionate about the work, then their creativity will follow. Mm. And, you know, the hardest part for me for years was letting go. But knowing my wife had the best interest of me and her at the same time, I could release my calendar to them. And the biggest piece that they did and what Maddie, and my wife did was force us to plan six months to a year out. And, mm -hmm. you know, her thing is if you plan first, you own the calendar. And she started planning stuff and I, I, I released it, let go. Yeah. And all of a sudden everything took off. So some people might describe you as a road warrior, right? I mean, you are literally hitting the road nonstop. How do you feel about that? Is that something that you still enjoy today as much as you did even years back? Or is it something that you're thinking about, you know, planning some changes around into the future? Well, recently we, we, you know, what's funny, the hardest part of the road is your health. Mm. It's sleep and diet and exercise. And because it's easy to not eat well, eat at hotels and eat at really nice restaurants and drink sure. wine and have the, you know, mashed potatoes and the steak and, uh, you know, high salt foods and things like that. And then you got to get up and do the next day. Mm -hmm. And when you start speaking this much, you realize that you can't drink anymore. Well, I was never a big drinker anyways, but mm. you just can't. You can't do it and you can't eat bad foods. You have to plan workouts first. I'm at the point now where we literally will fly food. Either I fly with it. If it's a two day event, I can make my food, take a cooler with me and I have my food. That way I don't have to think. I don't mm -hmm. have to think about restaurants. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to worry about poor choices. I don't have to worry about, you know, being tired and feeling like the emotional need to celebrate something. I can just eat good. And then I wake up the next day and my clients, you know, my clients, you know, these big events, they go out and they party some nights and, I'm in bed at, you know, nine o'clock and, and <laughs> right. they're like, why are you going to bed? I go, cause, cause you hired me, <laughs> I'm right. working yeah. and you know, I'm there at 6am the next day as ready to go. And they're not, but they're so thankful that I have the energy mm -hmm. to carry them. And that to me was a discipline that took me a long time to, to learn. Yeah. And I'm grateful for it. The hard part, you know, my wife travels with me as much as possible and, um, we've got a great support system, but I, don't want to do it forever. I know that I'm going to still do it for a few more years. The book has been, you know, doing well, so we're we're meeting demand and doing all that stuff. But it's we are looking at different models that are more scalable. Yeah. Yeah. But without without sacrificing impact. No, I mean, and that's that was really kind of connected to my my next question, which is when you look at your model right now, it, it still very much relies on on Renee, right? Like you are doing, mm -hmm. from what I can tell, the vast majority of the delivery of. Yep the knowledge, the expertise, you know, the, the solution and so forth. So what, what are you thinking right now? I know you're not there yet. You're kind of just maybe playing with some ideas or, or exploring, but wh what do you think the future looks like? Because a lot of people, when they're in a similar situation, it's, it's a challenge given that you're bringing in so much revenue and income and profit with a, with a model that is clearly working. So what are your thoughts on shifting from a model that, that is working, but you know, that maybe is not, you know, in your best interests from a health perspective or just, you know, the travel may, might be too much. What are you guys kind of talking about or exploring? Where do you think this might go? So we have a franchise agreement already with a um, um, graduate school in Italy. And their program, it's the co-founder of the Neuroleadership Institute, saw what we were doing. Uh, he actually wrote the forward in the book. Mm. And so we are, we have licensed them to do that in, for Europe. So that's a 
fun way of getting that out there. They do some yeah. similar work in, in a different arena, but they have the skill sets to train this. And so when, and, when you say the license them, so they essentially will take your, your body of work, your IP, and they can deliver that through workshops or talks. Yes. And how do you yeah. get, what will that look like from a monetary, you know, 20, benefit? 20%. Yeah. Of, of anything that they book using your IP mm -hmm. or you, yeah. okay. And, but it, what, what's crazy is I didn't do it for money. Like right. we're, we're, we're not even, I didn't even, we, I, Dr. Al and I get on a phone all together. You know, he's the co-founder of the Neural Leadership Institute. This guy is making my work better. And, right. yeah. you know, the collaboration, the concepts that we share, it's like one of those that, you know, I believe that this works needs to get out to as many people as possible. So we didn't do it for a financial reason. We did it because mm -hmm. it just made sense right. for the work to survive. And the value that he would contribute to the work in terms of research and validation and uh, just more, I just, it, it just, it's just the right thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are looking at also, I've got requests all the time for people that want to be certified in, in delivering the Amplify course and things like that. So we're looking at that model. I used to have 37 consultants that did the Engage course. That's a, it's hard to manage. <laughs> it, it sounds like, like you were kind of picking up where your mom left off in terms of the business with that many people. Yeah, I just don't know if I want, I, well, after 9-11, it was when we decided, I don't know if we wanted that model anymore. Mm. And so it's tempting, uh, but, you know, the future holds uh, a lot more larger scale events where people can come selling from there, uh, you know, having maybe facilitators in the room that can help do more, some of the training, but right. innovating the methodology so that people can have those transformations. The book is really, like, I'm, I guess I'm happiest about the book is that and what's crazy is it cannibalizes other bigger sales. You could say that. But to me, people are saying, I read the book and I'm able to do X, Y, and Z. And they didn't have to spend $6,000. Mm -hmm. And that to me makes me happy because mm -hmm. we wanted something that would be free. That's why we created the podcast. The podcast is free. And people say the most value comes from the podcast. Mm -hmm. Then 25 bucks is the book or 28, depending on when you buy it on Amazon. And then, you know, we've got our annual AmpCon event. So we do a big AmpCon, Amplify Conference event in Las Vegas. It's, you know, 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's, that'll be, you know, 600 to a thousand people. And then we've got our Amplify course, which is 6,000 and then engage, which would be 35,000, which would be, you know, but it's for 40 people. Right. So it's, you get, you can find me anywhere along that spectrum. And, but the Amplify Academy, which would be our on-demand course is going to be around $3,400 for the year. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be like an ongoing coaching for maybe a hundred, hundred to two, anywhere between a hundred and three hundred dollars a month for two uh, Zoom events a month. Gotcha. Well, Rene, I mean, there's so much more that we could um, continue this conversation uh, around and I really enjoyed it, but I wanna be conscious of the time that we have. Uh, before wrapping up, just a few final questions for you, then we'll make sure that people can find out where they should specifically go to learn more about you and, and sure. your book. Uh, so for you, it, it sounds like you've probably already covered a bit of this, but just to make sure that we bring it to the forefront, uh, with everything that you have going on, uh, clearly, you know, I would imagine that you have some habits, uh, a couple of things maybe that you do on a regular, maybe even daily basis that you feel really contribute to your performance and, and success and focus. What, what would you say those things are? You know, I, to me, in terms of the, there's the business side where you're always looking at a pipeline. Mm. You have to have a pipeline of ideas. You have to constantly do things to put yourself out there. And for, if you're starting this out, trying to grow if you've got time do free work mm. like f why not put yourself in front of places that people can see what you're doing mm -hmm. comics the best comics in the world to go to open mic night yeah. and they don't get paid to do that right. but they don't bring their best material they bring new material mm -hmm. they don't bring proven material they bring testing material and they they spend months if not a year testing out a joke to see where it lands and how it lands and that joke takes on a form so when they get their hbo special they're they're not wondering if people are going to laugh they've already had thousands of people laugh in the underground and so the conversations that you have i'm, I'm testing my ideas for years before they make it to the stage mm. with every conversation i'm having it's like hey what do you think of this you know there's ideas i shared tonight today on our podcast Every mm -hmm. podcast, why, why do I do it? Because it's, it's more of an opportunity to share and to get feedback on something. Yeah. And when you can get feedback on something and you can test an idea, you know when you get to the big stage, it's not your first time sharing it. And so mm -hmm. constantly philosophizing around what you believe and sharing that and being open to what people's real response is. 
is the best thing because then you get to the group and it's you already know the response. Yeah. So I'd say that would be one of them for sure. And um, I mean, if you want more more than one, I can give you more. But I think that'd be well, yeah. I mean, that's, if, if there's anything else that really stands out, but I think that's a that's a great idea or great kind of seed to to plant for people. Just the the final question, uh, and then we'll make sure that we have everything linked up in the show notes on consultingsuccess.com. But um, for you, one book that you read or listened to in the last six months, um, you know, aside from your book, anything that stands out, anything that you just really enjoy that you'd recommend to, uh, to people? Well, so I'm going to give you a book that, that I read when I was um, in my early 20s okay. that today is still the best book for consultants to read. And it's about how to sell high-end technology. But what, because I, there was nothing back then that told me how to sell consulting. But technology is an intangible, and so is consulting. And so if you can make the leap between those two, this will change your life. It's a book called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play mm. by Mahan Khalsa. And he's a Harvard professor. And if you can get the audio first, listen to him. Because the way he gives you the nuances of what he thinks, and more importantly, how he builds a value proposition or how he builds a business case for what you do, Mm. how you get to the issues then you get to discover the evidence of the issue and then the impact issue evidence impact around an opportunity it, it is life-changing i've listened to it probably 400 times wow i've studied that book it is ingrained in my soul it's how i talk get that book uh well that is certainly one that we have not uh had anyone that's we're you know coming towards 300 episodes on the podcast and uh, the first time somebody has mentioned this book. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, and we'll definitely make sure we link that up um, and try and get it out there. But turning now over to you, Renee, as, as just the final uh, point for our time together today, for those that want to learn more about your book, uh, about all the work you, you have going on, all the different programs and so forth, uh, is it meetrenee.com? Is that the main place they should go or anything else we should tell people? MeetRenee.com has a link to everything. Uh, follow me on Instagram is probably a really good thing uh, at C Renee Speak S E E Renee R E N E Speak S P E A K. Uh, that's the Instagram. But yeah, everything can be found right on Meet Renee, my book, to the podcast, to all our events, to, to yeah, you name it. All right, well, we're gonna link that up. Renee, thanks again for uh, spending some time together today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Likewise, this was fun. Thank you. Thanks.